Hello. I see the assassins have failed. I'm Grimgris, and I'm experimenting with videos during the live stream Lent. But before the live stream Lent began, I made an appearance on Pastor Paul's live stream, in which I did some accountability stalking, and uh, resulting in in this. I gotta turn that mustache upside down. Turn that frown <laughs> upside down. You gotta turn it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as an, a, a final a final bit of accountability stalking, I've been teased that there was going to be a defense against the dark arts conversation recorded or not between Kale and Paul Vanderclay. It and is I don't on know the schedule. All right, it's on the schedule. All right, it's on. The, all right, it's on the schedule. And and miraculously. The scheduled thing did happen, and this is my commentary video on this. With the power of the pause button, I will be doing a, a little, I will be playing a portion, and then I will interject by, uh, where is it? God bless. There it is. I will appear thisly and say things uh, uh, that they miss or, or get wrong, wrong during this video. I hope you enjoy this commentary. I hope you enjoy it. It meant that you had a one film contract, really. I mean, let's let's be honest. Um, you know, because the uh, well, in all the focus, of course, uh, it makes a certain amount of sense. You know, defense against the dark arts, especially, um, uh, it, which I do. You know, uh, you know, Grim, uh, uh, of course, sort of has invoked this from the beginning. Um, but I think that there's a real insight to that because um, if you look at the role that the dark arts play. Not only just in the Hogwarts world of, uh, but in the in the larger sphere in Harry Potter, you know. And again, just to nerd out here just for a second, just so we can fit, fit it in a situation and maybe then abstract out into you know our world. Um, that that the the defensive against the dark arts is sort of in this sleepwalking phase because you know Voldemort has been gone for ten years. And so in that 10 years, there's been a kind of letting down of the guard, a kind of letting, oh, well, do we even really need to teach those kinds of things? I mean, you know, and so you get into all those kind of arguments as to why uh, why would you even need a, a defense against the dark arts thing because Voldemort is gone. Right? And, and I have, you know, been teaching for the better part of three decades now. Um, and... You know, I see what you can do with a student in high school, but I know that they're being kind of frog marched into a kind of world that, you know, in, in certain respects, I feel that I have ill prepared them for because they're going to go to college. And at least the way that I see things, they go to college and either they, they sort of do one of two things, Paul, they either become um, pragmatist nihilists or they become um, true believers in the new gospel. You know, and the new gospel is? Well, yeah, so the new gospel can either be a kind of uh, sort of very sort of politically tinged, um, uh, a gospel of liberation, we might call it, yeah. um, or um, a sort of um, a, a kind of a nihilism. It, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. The new gospel is that Voldemort is dead. It's the blue church narrative. It's the, if you're not brought up any other way, this is what we want you to believe. Now, Paul responds in the quite interesting way of reciting the blue church narrative of Pearl Harbor and, and how that portion of setting setting himself in this timeline to break that into a story of from Nancy in which he seems to be equating the formation that the church groups used to go through to what would pass for a defense against the dark arts class in today's world ifs on that and her little tell kit tell comments are really important if you understand her story because she says and she's right when she was a little girl She's a, she's a, she's basically a boomer. When she was a little girl, every week, in addition to the Christian school that you had, you also had catechism class taught by the minister or an elder, and grades were assigned for catechism class. I mean, and so this process of formation was 
deep within the Christian Reformed Church, and all sorts of things followed from that. Denominational identity, denominational confidence, uh, deno sacrificial giving on the part of people for the denomination. When in the Christian reform uh, communities, when did did let's say when did it when was it not the case that a kid went to catechism class with a pastor or an elder and received grades? So sort of using that as the kind of the the, the funny model. When did that stop? Or it all did it? depended on where those churches were within the urban monoculture. Ah. I'd just like to point out that when we're mapping the spread of the urban monoculture, it's useful to watch uh, the adoption of set and uh, those percentages as well. Sounds to me like uh, in our varying, our various traditions, right, there was something that occurred sometime in the 60s, right, uh, 60s, 70s, let's call it, in which this kind of uh, focus on a catechism, a kind of axiomatic um, starting from, uh, you know, arguing from, from axioms, um, you know, like a catechism or like Euclid or, you know, any of those kinds of things, um, that that got abandoned. And so then what are you then? Like, what do you do? So I can sort of get, you know, what in, in the CRC tradition, as far as formation is concerned, once it, it moved away from the explicit instruction in the Heidelberg catechism, what took its place? I think we have to talk about pedagogy, which is interesting, of course, because you are a teacher and of yeah. course, pastors, it's one of yeah. the things pastors do. Yeah. I just want to throw the interject here at this point is that what ages were people catechized and would that serve as a, uh, you're part of it now, uh, coming of age initiation ritual? The whole reason for the, the emergence of these kinds of books now, it, it was so funny because I, I remember seeing this book around when I was a little kid. It was yeah. a little ahead of me. But yeah. reading it now, it just drips of, you know, you have kind of yeah. 60s, 70s oh, yeah, art. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I could give you, I mean, again, the, I, I could give you, you know, multiple iterations of this in the Catholic register as well, right? And, yeah. it's, it's, uh, and you know, it's graduated to so this, like the Baltimore Catechism 1, which sort of upgrades to 2 to 3 to 4. And 4 was, I, I believe, if memory serves four was like the adult one. Like, so you kind of work your way up to it. And like, there's the sort of the, the funny art from the sixties and then the funny art from the seventies and then the sort of the, um, you know, then the, the, the iterations in the eighties, you know, it's just, it's, you know, cringe, you know. Uh. Now here then is a particularly interesting part of the video when they see the effect of mimetic warfare in terms of what they're calling pedagogy. Of that is of course the fact that in critiquing this form of education, they actually used it because I just used the word of that catechism. Okay, why was that? Because I, yeah, I heard it too. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. In my own way. Um, why? What's the boogeyman there? You know what I mean by that? I, I know exactly what the boogeyman was there because of everything that was. So this. These silos of religious formation and 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 inter-Christian religious warfare that you know had been that that basically for hundreds of years had been maintained. Yes. Was well, I mean, one of the things that we had in our documents was all about the detestable, you know, the the, the Roman the, the Roman mass was idolatrous. Sure, sure. Because of course you add images and you add right. and so. And so all of this stuff was maintained and you formed children with this language so that they would get the heebie-jeebies when they buy, went by a Roman Catholic church. I still have that built into me today. That yeah. kind of formation works well. But I think yeah. part of what happens in the Second World War is... And I'd just like to interject here that uh, the pedagogical formation of the heebie-jeebies is still occurring and call into your mind the question of what uh, the children are giving the being given the heebie-jeebies about today uh, perhaps climate change or other oppression here's a quick distillate of the next section where paul goes from the formation falling apart in foxholes to the tip of the spear of uh, 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 civil rights 
and and the replacement of formation in by the like handed over to set but i think part of what happens in the second world war is where you have christian reformed youth irish catholic youth um Jews. italian catholic you begin to have intermarriage mm -hmm. you're looking across the bunk in your transport across the pacific and yeah, he's got his rosary, and you're looking at him saying, well, oh, that's idolatrous, that rosary. You're, mm -hmm. you're looking at all of this stuff, but in the end, you're in the foxhole with this guy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you eventually say, I'm not so sure he's not going to heaven that's with right. me. Yeah, that's right. And we do, and again, this is, and, and part of what was lost in the transport ships going across the Pacific was that confidence, because a lot of that confidence was built on I'm right and you Catholics are wrong. Yeah. And that's a that that sort of psychologically is a very strong thing for for us. There was in America, and I think the the civil rights movement had a big piece of this because the the civil rights movement pointed out the the the, the it was it was impossible for mainliners eventually evangelicals, Roman Catholics, to not look at the systemic, multi-generational treatment of African Americans and say, wow, did, did, did we ever miss that? Mm -hmm. And if we missed that, what else did we what miss? Else? And I think right, there's right. a big part of the rise of the urban monoculture, mm -hmm. suddenly when the civil rights movement sort of becomes the 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 um the point of the spear for a whole bunch of other liberation movements. Well, you've treated African Americans poorly. What about women? Yeah. What about gays? Right. What about you know? And then everything comes in, and at some point you begin to say, "Well, well, well, where really is the center of this gospel?" And mm -hmm. but okay, but what then does that mean? Where then is the gospel and how yeah. do we form children in it? And I think whereas sort of the confidence built in generations before has been lost and we're at a place where now suddenly we're looking around for confidence and identity and new centers. And, and then, you know, even pedagogically to say, well, you know what? Memorization. It's a pretty profound pedagogical tool for children because guess what? You know, I can recite how many ditties right. Right. from television. Now we're back to Grim Grizzland yeah. from the from the from the world of set. Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Um Frosted Flakes. They're great. Mikey, I mean, and Mikey, he likes it. Exactly. So we so we threw out mm -hmm. kind of the the programmatic repetition and formation by memorization of our youth <laughs> and gave it all to set. Yeah. So the world wars taught us that the, the world was bigger than we could understand. And we came to turn to set to understand the bigness and the com complexity of the world and let that form us rather than being formed by our uh, podunk traditions and elders who had been through a different time without the connection to the world via set. And now, the 33rd minute. So suddenly, of course, the, the women in church office fight in the Christian Reformed Church was sort of peak baby boomer urban monoculture hegemony in terms of the wave that goes through the Christian form church. Right. And so they, so, so then, you know, women in church, women in ministry then becomes just the next, the next thing on that list. And then of course this 25 year fight in the Christian form church over this finally, finally gets settled because the Christian form church just out of exhaustion is mm -hmm. tired of this fight. We have to get it off of our, our synodical dockets, because it's the only thing that's occupying the attention, the relevance realization of the Christian Reformed Church. So then we have this, we have this pragmatic compromise, basically the local option, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and about 
you know, 30 to 50,000 members of the Christian Reformed Church leave from the most conservative area. Got it. But then we also begin to see conservatism starting to come up. And this is what really surprises. Yeah. yeah. That, that started coming up in urban areas. Yeah. We're like, conservatism isn't supposed to be in urban areas. So then, of course, you get all the way to now in the Christian Reformed Church and the fight over same sex marriage. And all of the leadership had been formed by this wave. And now suddenly they're they're just in shock because but and and they don't realize that number one, many in the urban monoculture just kept moving. Yeah. <laughs> they just kept moving into assimilation in the urban monoculture. And right, because, so, because you can really, you know, to, not, not to be too cute about it, but you really can only serve one master, right? And, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to score cheap points here, but I just being just, just being very clear about it, right? You know, you know, what spirit are you following? And it would appear that the spirit of, if the summum bonum is liberation, then this, the summum bonum doesn't, in that iteration, does not seem to have carved out a place for it, piety. Right. And, and, and piety is met with suspicion. Right, of course. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's it's just old fashioned. It. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so even, even though there's all of these, and this, of course, James K. Smith writes about this a decade ago in the Christian Reformed Church. There's all of these implicit liturgies yes, that right. have in fact been forming the urban monoculture. And so now suddenly, because of the way the Christian Reformed Church works in terms of synods and classes and delegates and all of that. Suddenly you get to Senate 2022 and 2023 and the progressives who have just by virtue of their filters imagine they are the vanguard of history and everyone will sweep along and it's only a matter of time. Just go back and listen to those synods. They're all on YouTube. Speech after speech after speech of the progressives are basically reciting their liturgies and then the votes are taken and it's like we're 30% of the church. Yeah, with thirty percent right. of the votes, right? I mean, it's like someone could say, like, "We want a two-thirds majority." Yeah, yeah, you're past that, buddy. Yeah, and, right. and it, I'd look it, around and say, "Your votes are no longer there because your churches are no longer there." Right. You have fruit, right? Yeah. This is this is my this is my constant refrain, you know, with those would-be liberationists in my own church. You know, they don't have children, and I mean that literally. Sorry, physically. Um, I mean that physically, they don't have children. Um, but I also mean it metaphorically, right? That they 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 do not bear, they don't have a legacy in the various ways in which we we understand that. Word. Um, and and so when when I hear when I when I was listening to you talk about the when when the progressives woke up after one of the synods and were like, oh my gosh, we don't have the votes, it's because you forgot the most basic fundamental uh, reality, which is the next generation. Yeah. You're so busy trying to be ahead of the curve of, you know, history as if history has a shape. I mean, right. I mean, that's, that's the implicit things that you buy in with the progressivist myth or mythos, you know, you, for you, you were all worried about being in front of the, the arc of history. Um, but you forgot, um, the future. And then they kind of go who knows where for about 20 minutes, but Paul does try to bring him back around to the topic at hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Among other things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I when I was thinking about, okay, defense against the dark arts, and I was thinking about, yeah, all of these, you know, so often the defense against the dark arts professor at Hogwarts is right there in the middle of this embroilment. But the way you set it up initially is important because a lot of what happened in the counterculture and the assimilation of our churches in that culture was exactly what you just said, where we no longer need to worry about talking about Protestant Catholic differences anymore. And again, part of what's key in this little corner is we like talking about differences between denominations, but we like talking about it in a different way. Yeah. All right, we're having this issue where they're focusing on the defense against the dark arts professor angle of the thing. And, and what, what, I, what, there, what doesn't seem to be translating or transposing properly is that in the books, the, the children realizing that the institution supposedly teaching them 
that uh, Defense Against the Dark Arts was among those that didn't believe Voldemort was back. They had to take teaching the, the Defense Against the Dark Arts on themselves, in which they found the room of requirement. And similarly, we as citizens, muggles of our current society, um, have discovered that uh, Voldemort isn't dead, despite the, the news telling us he is. And, and we are all in the foxhole now. The whole world has become the foxhole because all of the information is flooding in. And as such, we are coming together, cobbling together what is this online virtual room of requirement which is a part of the defense against the dark arts metaphor you guys seem to be missing entirely here then therefore they get into an interesting bit about generational knowledge transfer cross generational rationing and what it's like to be boomers another interesting thing about the reformers that eerie nails right at the beginning of his book they're all people of a selective generation. It, it's amazing, right? It's like yes. in, in the corollary, the corollary for us, right, is that if if we're thinking about it in in boomer, Gen X, Gen Z, millennial terms, they're millennials, right? Or maybe they're Gen Zs, okay, right? So, keep, so keep if, 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 yeah, if, if eerie, if eerie, if I'm if I'm remembering my eerie correctly, this is his book Reformations, by the way, yes. folks. They are all born. After the printing press has been, they've never known a world in which the printing press hasn't been a reality. Right. Right. And so. And the know, new world is discovered. Uh, right. Exactly. And that the new world has been. But actually, I believe the new world. No, you're, that, you're exactly right. Wait. It's no, right I, on the cusp there. Right. Well, so new world's 1492. So, you know, and, and then the uh, Gutenberg is 1537. No, no, can't be. But it's printing... four, four, sorry, printing press is 1450s, I believe. Yes, yes. And then yes. and then and then Columbus is 14 Okay. So and it's gonna take a little time for that printing press to really right. get going, too. Right. But they but they but they but it's part of their social imaginary. Yes. Right. And I think that's where Taylor is so important for me here, right? So that this is a very specific generation in which they they know about the new world and the Gutenberg press has always been a reality. So books, and of course. Books were very quickly, it was, it, they proliferated very quickly because when people realized, oh my gosh, I don't, you know, I can get a book, it became like a thing. And we can see this exact same thing happen with our own technologies here. Yeah. Right? Yep. Amazing when I read Erie's book, because I read that chapter, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. all of these years yeah, of yeah, education, yeah. Yeah. no one ever pointed that exactly. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's as exactly if it right. was, incidental yeah like oh they, oh yeah by the way you know columbus gutenberg whatever let's get back to luther like no like they are formed by their social imaginary just like we are like and that's that's why it's it's exactly how my mind was popping when i when i when i was when i was looking at that right it's 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 like oh of course because because what is so if you if you had been 20 years older than luther let's say you would have had a memory of a world without books and without Columbus. So therefore without, you know, doubling the size of what you thought the world was, let's what you think of as possible and real is radically different. Yes. Much like all the men on the screen. Remember a time that the before the internet was real and what is possible and real to the next generation is well beyond our grokking. And as if to define the context of a defining generational moment, uh, culture is moving I know what that you mean. fast. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. But but okay, think about the moon landings. Imagine right. if we went to the moon and there was a world of people on the moon. That's right. That's right. That's right. It could be enslaved and they had minerals that we wanted and they had crops that we wanted and, and they have getting... souls that need to be saved. Right. Yes. I mean, it's like, it's a, it's that's, I know people don't cynical people don't like to, to see that as a salient part of their imaginary, but it absolutely was. In fact, that's the, the miracle of, of, of colonialization. Oddly enough is that the Pope said, sorry, they're people. Deal with it. Yeah. And 
And then there's this very important moment where these ancient men discuss with us ancient history. Okay, so back to the Reformation period, you yeah. have you have this massive transformation in the imaginary of Europe. And of course, you have Spain, which had just recently sort of been rested. I mean, before then, everybody's thinking Catholic Islam. And of course, the Jews are, you know, sprinkled in this mix. But that's the big, the big enemy is Islam, right? That's who they're perpetually at war with for centuries. And now suddenly Spain gets de-Islamified. Right. And of course the Jews have to leave. And those are probably my ancestors. Yeah. And right. then um, and then suddenly Spain, which is sort of this new country. It's a new thing, right? It's right. It's 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 Isabel and Ferdinand, right? right. They they join forces in their marriage to create Spain as we know it. Right. And Portugal, when when Columbus, of course, an Italian goes to Portugal and wants money to go that way, the Portuguese are like, you're out of your mind. Everybody, Everybody knows, knows there's something yeah. over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody also knows it's too far. Yeah. We're not going to do this. And and the Spanish are like, what do we got? You know? They this, well, they took a flyer. They took a yeah. flyer. Like, whatever. Here, take three boats. <laughs> yeah. And then suddenly it catapults Spain into this Catholic superpower, Yeah. which then, of course, is going to set the... Um, set the Protestants as tremendously terrified of Roman Catholics for now generations to come into the Americas. And people wonder why so much anti-Catholicism in America. They're scared to death of the French and the Spanish. Right. And especially, you know, again, it, people forget this because we're used to looking at map, the current maps. But, you know, your 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 folk up in the Netherlands, they were run by the Spaniards. Yeah, they right? revolted. <laughs> Right. You know, so it's just like the, these weird empires were strange and morphed and yeah, very strange. And if you and even back to the Heidelberg Catechism, yeah. If you if you're in northern Germany, if you're in Germany and you want to resist on the economics, the politics, all of these things, you of course adopt a different religion. Yeah. So we need to write this catechism so our children grow up right. just like in a May and in, in you know what's happening in schools right now. Like in a man, that's the thing about curriculums, right? The curriculums are are catechisms, and and you really need to understand. Curriculums are happy yeah. about and, it, and, and that curriculums are are catechisms, and and you really need to understand that. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean it's bad. I'm I, you know because I want to be very clear. I don't think either of us are saying catechisms are a bad thing. I mean, they're inevitable in some real way. They just simply have to be balanced by a what I would call it a kind of an embodied, embodied communities, right? Uh, but you know, because what what happened in 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 my church is that after after the councils, there was all kinds of confusion, right? And so finally, John Paul II commissions the writing of a new catechism. And so when I was in college, the catechism of the Catholic Church was was printed and promulgated. And all of a sudden, overnight, all of this kind of stuff that had been passed on to students and families as, well, Catholics can now believe X, Y, and Z, all of a sudden that gets like, wait, what? Because that's not what the catechism say. So that like ticked off all of the, I would say, the progressive element in the church because they loved not having an explicit catechism because they could just be the catechism, right? And so, so. You know, we asked before, okay, how does how how does the gospel get transmitted if you don't have a catechism? Mm -hmm. Well, and the same with the urban monoculture. How does the urban monoculture get 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 transmitted if you keep your catechism implicit? In a sense, it's a little easier because especially depending on what exactly your your gospel is, yeah. you can keep tinkering with it as you go. And mm -hmm. because of basically the perpetual amnesia of successive generations and human yeah. beings, yeah. you can very quickly forget that, oh yeah. And so it, then suddenly you read an old book. So one of the things that's happening- Well, well right. It, so it, it's it's elective amnesia. And, and what, you know, that's really perilous territory, you know, um, We're because- We're all concerned. Right, right. And as old K.O. goes into this next part, imagine how much worse the phenomenon is for the rural kids now exposed to yon internet. 
get run through. But, 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 you know, I would run to the mailbox once a month to receive the Oracle from Rolling Stone magazine that would take me out of my, you know, my, my sorry, sad little backward Southern town. And I could dream about New York or LA or Paris or London. And I did. Right. And so, I mean, there's all these aspects to this layer because of course, getting television, I mean, now, I mean, you can get some of it in print, but boy, I mean, the civil rights movement, would, the Vietnam War, the civil rights movement, the evolution of television and how those things played out culturally, politically, religiously was absolutely key. Same yeah. thing with the lunar. I mean, can you imagine if there had been a television crew with Columbus coming right. into the new right. world? But now we talk about these things is in some ways really context dependent. So therefore, what is the underneath that could possibly connect these things? Because we no longer talk the same way. Right. Um, so what, but what is, what does remain, you yes. know? And, and so, so I know, you know, for me, the urban monoculture Oracle say of the Rolling Stone magazine and that, and that cluster of that, that worldview, both through the music and the music videos of MTV and, and that whole ethos, that disconnected me radically from everything that had come before. But what reconnected me was, you know, a good teacher reading a really old book and letting the really old book speak to me on its own terms. Yeah. But I had a true professor. Yeah. Right? yeah. And th this, this, this vast body of wisdom that set has disconnected us from, and that the urban monoculture has disconnected us from. I know that that holds, it's almost, it's, it's, it's exactly what we need. It has in it somehow. And it's what we need, but it's not just like jug, mug, right? Yeah. There's something about actually wrestling with the material, right? Yeah. As, as a practice, right? That it's a, it's a, it's a very understandable response to what you always talk about with combinatorial explosiveness, right? That, that in, in, in eras in which things are, are in flux and in doubt, and there's more information that you can possibly wrap your head around it. We're looking for certain technologies that will simplify the the the, the game, right? I you know I call these sort of cultural jigs, right? Because um, you need you need a workaround. You, you need or workaround is the wrong way. You need a you need a something to manage your workflow. Right. You, um, need, you need a compression engine. That's you need right. something to yeah. take too much and to say, okay, right. I can't manage the whole thing, so I'll do this, right? Because right. so, I've got so, confidence in this. Yeah, and, and 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 so therefore, I I am sympathetic to the trad the very all the varieties of trad right because it is at least a recognition that something's wrong right it's at least a recognition that the you know the the thin gruel that we were served is is not up to the task and so therefore it's time to get serious about it and so you know you're seeing this with you know um you know the, you know the orthodox of course are the envy of the trad world because they do lent for real you know those kinds of things um and will and, and of course the the tell will be time right you know yes. you know will will you be able to replicate um and pass on to a, a successive generation or two and really the, what what every what every sort of trad bro who's on twitter flaming all the liberals and all the lefties etc what they should be worried about is their grandchildren don't worry about me i'm old you know like i'm whatever like i'm doing whatever i'm doing you need to worry be worried about your grandchildren because that's you know that's the only way it 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 means anything because every and then the discussion takes a very interesting turn when when the kale starts to recognize similarities between an imaginary reformer time and the time we live in imagine what it would be like to be calvin let's just use and again i don't 
full disclosure, you know a heck of a lot more about Calvin than I do, but just I'm just just as I myself, should. <laughs> yeah, right. As a Calvinist, right. No, but I mean, like, you know, if 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 memory serves, he would he was born a French Catholic, right? Yes. Yes. And then right, okay, good. That's that's okay. So imagine got his education because of all these um, you know, ways of getting money and the Catholic structure and hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. Right. So, you know, so imagine looking at this sea of embedded um, uh, corruption, you know, you, 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 uh, of which you cannot even see the bottom of like you could you could you could, you know, move, move things to the side to the side to the side all day long and never get to the bottom right. of that. Imagine of that Joe Biden. Yeah. naming archbishops yeah. and bishops right. Right. and clergy in America. Think about yeah. that, folks. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. You hear this crazy story. So so the world that you live in is nearly totally corrupt. There's not a there's not a parcel of land that isn't touched by someone with dirty hands. And you hear this story cuz it can only be a story. It's not a picture, it's not a film, it's not even a book yet. But you get a story about a whole half of a whole a whole half of a globe that you didn't know existed. Now, as far as I know, Calvin didn't have any pretensions about going to the new world. Is that fair? Okay, good. All right. But it doesn't matter. Imagine the idea that there's a place where you could start over. That we do not have. We have where do we begin? the rubble or our sins. So so therefore here we are, right? That's right. Okay. So so we stand on, you know, clearly we're we're living through uh, an evocative liminal period. Um and, and and it's funny because the trads on one hand are especially the ortho trads and I'm so, imagine the Roman Catholic trads mm -hmm. and now our recession of modernity they would say oh, gosh, the darn Protestant reformation but in many ways, if you're wearing medieval clothing and taking on a church name, this is exactly what the reformers did because they also yeah. wanted to get yeah. beyond so, the world of corruption back so, to that pure world right. of the New Testament. Yeah. So, Paul, this is why I know I, I say it all the time. We're all Protestants, right? And this is this is this is exactly what I mean by that. Now you can say, you know, or I, I also say we're all heretics, right? That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Right. Is that, you know, the, 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 you're not really being trad. You're really being in a weird sort of way, a kind of retro progressive. Yeah. Right. It, it's, uh, and it, and, and I just, I just don't know how, I don't know if they're capable of developing that kind of detached standpoint with which they, with which they can look at that. So again, so what I'm worried about with my own students is how can I get them to affect a both a detached and deeply engaged standpoint yeah. to see the world. Yeah. Like that, like that, that's the thing. That's but what I, I think, get. I think we go all the way back to where we start about the catechism, which is Kale, you can only give them what you have. Hmm. And what you have is you. And I think that's really what's at the heart of this corner in terms hmm. of this, this personalism that, and, and you won't hit every student, but um, you, there will be, you will be communicating something to your students just by who you are and how you love mm -hmm. that will, that will get into them. And part of, I mean, the strangeness of this little corner is that this is what's happening. I mean, obviously something of me is in the corner along right, with right. Verveke and Peterson sure, and Peugeot sure, and, sure, sure. and you and Grizz and, you know, something of each of us is getting and Chad, the alcoholic, something right. of each of us is getting inside of us. Right. And, and so, you know, your defense, you are the prof you are the defense against the dark arts professor. <laughs> and I've lasted more than one year. So that's, that's good, I guess. <laughs> well, well, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I look, I, not trying to toot my own horn. I, I think that's right. I, I think I'm realizing that I, I have kind of functioned that way, you know, as, as a kind of defense against the dark art teacher, but, but I, I, I'm, maybe this is my own ego, 
I don't think it is, but I want to find a way to give more of that. Yeah. Right. You know, you know, it's, it's, and, and, and I'm, and I'm coming to the realization that there's really little difference between what we're trying to do and what in my own tradition, we would have just called, you know, you have to be a saint. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I tweeted this out as, um, mindful of our name and profession, we have the need to live well and have not gained a license to do wrong. Mm. We must do this lest we give laymen any pretext to sin or mm. cause them rightly to have a low opinion of the clergy and derive therefrom an excuse to persevere in their faults. Therefore, we must make special effort to do the works of the saints and to make our deeds shine in the presence of men and to be watchful and solicitous of that evangelical salt in our ministry, planting, weeding, and scattering, and with the greatest zeal, building up what makes for holiness. Mm -hmm. And then and then it seems as though Kale might actually get it. Perhaps actually and metaphorically you know the the students that that god has seen fit to put in front of me are rich men yeah as the parable goes yeah. right and you know, they're in need of they're in need of the gospel too yeah and and it just the 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 thought of them you know sort of going out into that world and just before they even have a chance to notice they've been like a spell has been cast upon them yeah. um and i might even mean that actually yeah. um of of again functionalist nihilistic materialistic yeah. you know that 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 gets me you know that that yeah. that that not only for the world, you know, but like for them, like, like for them, you know, that, that, you know, I think about, you know, Luke, I think it's Luke 12. Um, you know, basically Jesus says, you know, be of good cheer, little flock. Um, because, you know, basically I'm giving it to you. The kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is, is, is accessible all around you. I mean, the, the kingdom of heaven isn't, the, the kingdom of heaven isn't behind a paywall. The kingdom of heaven isn't at the front of an enormous line that you don't have time or life or money or leisure to wait in. The kingdom of heaven is at hand and is at hand for for any of us. I mean, that's that's the that's the amazing the amazing thing about the kingdom of heaven that it is um, you know, again, it's I have someone made a great meme of it they have the two lines the line um the line of people waiting to be loved and then the line where you can go to love and there's no there's no line on that on that door <laughs> there's no line at that desk right. you you have people around you right now who need to be loved and you can love them and that's where it starts so so I, I don't know how well this is delivered on the defense against the dark arts topic in general. I do like how it relates that uh, there are no atheists or Protestants or denominations in a foxhole and how that we the foxhole is now everywhere around us. And I do like the, uh, the similarities and parallels with the reformers that they've, they've discussed. Um, I think the important thing is to remember that uh, we're all in this together. And um, maybe maybe as we evolve and, uh, and progress, we'll have our own little defense against the dark arts catechism that, you know, mentions fifth generational warfare and the like. Uh, this has been my commentary video, Refractory Data. I hope... <laughs> I hope you got something out of it, especially if you didn't watch the whole thing with Paul and Kale. Eh?